A&E's Ancient Mysteries is brought to you in part by Mercedes-Benz, where safety, reliability, performance, and value are never optional. And by MCI. What catastrophe destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? Archaeologists uncover new evidence next on Ancient Mysteries. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zohar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of the heavens. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Genesis 19.23 The ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed by God for their wickedness. It is perhaps one of the best known of all the stories in the Bible. But did these evil cities actually exist? And if so, were they destroyed by fire and brimstone? Our ability to uh, recreate the historical context of the Bible is limited. Here at the Dead Sea, new scientific discoveries may support the Bible's telling it now seems possible that these dramatic events did, in fact, take place. This pair of cities may very well fit the biblical pair that you have in the Bible regarding Sodom and Gomorrah. There is evidence of burning which suggests a destruction uh, and a fiery destruction uh, as uh, an explanation of the end of the city. But could this catastrophic destruction some 5,000 years ago have been an act of God? Some scholars say yes. And what of the great sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? Was it sexual depravity, as most people believe? Some scholars say no. These are but a few of the mysteries of the Bible. Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Genesis 13, 12. And thus the Bible tells us God's attention is drawn toward the cities of the plain, toward the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. It is one of the earliest stories of the Bible, told soon after Adam and Eve and Noah's Ark. Two cities are destroyed by fire and brimstone for their wickedness, for not living up to the ethical standards of God. Is the Bible describing an actual event? Or is this story meant more as a lesson, as a warning against sinful behavior? The only written record of Sodom and Gomorrah is in the Old Testament. The question that has intrigued scholars for centuries is this. Is there any outside evidence to support this great biblical tale? There are geographical clues in the Bible, and from these, scholars have come to believe the cities may have actually been located at the south end of the Dead Sea. 
The theories about the location of Sodom and Gomorrah, or generally the cities of the plain, uh, under the southern basin of the Dead Sea, it just didn't make any sense to locate cities down in a valley where you would be prone to attack and being wiping out, because the early Bronze Age, the patterns that we understand are basically defensive patterns higher up on hills. So what we found, in fact, were that the towns were located on hills above the sea, looking down on the sea in an area that could be easily defended. In 1924, a find is made in Jordan, near the south end of the Dead Sea. The remains of a walled city called Babedra, meaning Gate of the Arm. It would not be until 1965, however, that evidence uncovered here would date Babedra back to 3,000 years before Christ. This means the city existed in a place and time which could well be the same as the biblical Sodom, or Gomorrah. But this is only one city, and the Bible mentions two. Where is the other? Eight years later, in 1973, a startling find is made just seven miles south of Babadra. Called Numera, it dates back to the same period as its neighbor. The same time, roughly, as the Bible's saga of Sodom and Gomorrah. Since then, the scientific data gathered here supports a possible connection between the Bible's story and actual history. Did Sodom and Gomorrah exist? And if they did not, are there still lessons to be learned from this immortal story? And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. Genesis 18:20. But Abraham, whose nephew, Lot, lives in Sodom, protests God's intention to destroy the city. In one of the most extraordinary passages in the Bible, Abraham actually negotiates with God in an effort to save any people in Sodom and Gomorrah who may not be wicked. Then Abraham approached the Lord and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Genesis 18.23 Having gotten God to agree to spare Sodom, if fifty righteous souls can be found there, Abraham proceeds to bargain with the Lord. Probably the most famous scene in the first part of the Sodom and Gomorrah story, the first part involving Abraham and the messengers, is this famous scene where Abraham actually begins to barter with God over the lives of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And this bartering starts off that Abraham asks God, well, you wouldn't destroy this city if there were 50 innocent people, surely. And God agrees. Well, no, if there are 50 innocent, I'd spare the city. And Abraham continues to barter with God. Well, what about 10? What if there were 10? And the clear point of this part of the story is a discussion about the righteousness of God and God's judgment. No one is to be destroyed undeservedly. No one is to be destroyed unjustly. Having agreed to spare the evil cities, if ten righteous men can be found, God sends two angels to Sodom to make the determination. They are received warmly by Lot. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Genesis 19, 1. And so Lot, nephew of Abraham, welcomes the strangers into his home in the tradition of his people. 
And Lot said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. Genesis 19, 1. Lot is welcoming these visitors. That's part of the traditional law of hospitality, which, as many scholars have pointed out, that's an inviolate law of the Middle East, even to this day. I mean, to this day, to be a guest, for example, in an Arab home is to be treated like royalty. I've experienced it many times myself. And in the ancient period, it was clearly also that way. The problem is that Lot has made an exceedingly bad choice in his place to live. Lot is already in trouble for even being amongst the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah in the first place. There seems to be a general sense that our being God's people involves a certain distance from those that are not God's people. And there's almost a warning that we risk losing some of our calling. It is now that Lot will learn the true nature of his neighbors that he has made a fatal mistake. For the men of Sodom want to see his two guests. Two guests who, unbeknownst to the Sodomites, are heavenly angels in the guise of earthly men. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Genesis 19.4 that we may know them. It is the Bible's language for sexual knowing, the sexual act. For the first time, the Bible refers to the homosexual act and provides the origin for the word sodomy. This passage has an unfortunate uh, long history in uh, both uh, uh, Jewish and Christian circles, but especially in Christian circles as somehow a biblical condemnation of homosexuality. I think that that's a, a difficult interpretation of this passage. I think what we're talking about is sexual depravity in general. It is possible that the danger and the warning in the Bible's telling is not simply against a particular sexual act, but against sexual acts associated with another god, a pagan god. There is strong suggestion that one of the aspects of Canaanite religion that is possibly true is something that we call sacred prostitution. And that is some sexual rites that were considered a part of religious action or religious activities that were somehow intended to guarantee fertility, somehow intended to, to seek the blessing of the gods for not only your own human fertility, but the fertility of your fields, the fertility of your animals. These are clearly important concerns for an agricultural people uh, in Palestine. So this aspect of fertility with its sexual overtones was something that was seriously called into question by the Israelites. Whatever the interpretation, Lot is left with a dangerous problem. A mob of men outside his door clamoring for the guests he shelters in his home. All this even as the clock counts down the final moments of the evil city. When we return, Lot's surprising solution and the terrible end of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mysteries of the Bible will be back in a moment. We now return to Mysteries of the Bible. And so the biblical drama continues to unfold. It is the last day in the life of the doomed evil cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the men of Sodom do not know that. They are gathered outside Lot's door, a mob waiting for Lot to surrender his guests. And so the people of the town 
demand to see these visitors. The implication of the Bible is to somehow abuse them sexually en masse. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Genesis 19.6 In a surprising twist, Lot offers the mob his very own two daughters, rather than surrender the two guests who have found shelter in his home. And so Lot offers something that strikes the modern reader, I think, as highly unusual. He offers his daughters instead. In fact, he even says to them, my daughters who have yet to know any man. And so the modern reader is shocked at this kind of behavior of Lot, but we have to remember the, the sanctity of a visitor in your home was not to be violated. Even your own family was to be sacrificed for that. And Lot says... No, don't take the strangers. I have some virgin daughters. You can have them instead. Now, any modern person would say, what a horrendous thing to do. And in fact, the rabbinic tradition, that is, the rabbis of the Talmud saw it the same way. And what they said was, this goes to show how careful you have to be about your neighborhood. In the sense that Lot was influenced by living with evil people to do what was clearly an evil thing. The story thus both condemns Lot for doing it and the city for ever demanding of someone such an absurd choice. While the lesson for Lot may seem clear, a puzzle remains, and it centers on the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Who were these people? Where did they come from? And how, in the Bible's telling, did they become so extraordinarily evil? If Sodom and Gomorrah were real places, as many historians believe possible, their citizens would have had to be a sturdy, clever people. Today, the area surrounding the Dead Sea is one of the most arid, desolate areas in the world. To survive means having exceptional resourcefulness. 5,000 years ago, any people who lived here would have had to have been resourceful indeed. Scientists believe this place, this ruin that once was the thriving town of Babadra, is a strong candidate for the Sodom of the Bible. This place has grown and thrived for nearly a thousand years at the approximate time of Abraham. But nevertheless, existence here at Babadra was still primitive, and survival must have been a daily struggle. And yet to have gone on as long as it did, Babadra must have been an ordered society with a stable economy. So what then was the great sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? What was it that brought them God's wrath? What clues are there in the Bible to help scholars with the story's meaning? The Bible is very insistent on the need of treating strangers properly. Um, the rabbis comment on the fact that more than 30 times in the Bible it says you shouldn't oppress a stranger. And part of what they see as the sin of Sodom is the sin of hating the stranger. Thus, in this harshest of landscapes, where the difference between life and death often depends upon a sip of water or a piece of bread from a stranger, to offer help is a practical matter of survival, of mutual survival, of survival for everyone. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, Pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, 
and I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. Genesis 18, 2. This is the theme that is played out, that Sodom becomes the opposite of what Abraham is at his tent in the 18th chapter, a generous man, together with his wife Sarah, who receives these heavenly visitors, and Sodom is the opposite. The population of Sodom presses in upon these heavenly visitors and is extremely inhospitable to them. And I think that is what, uh, what the biblical tradition really wants to emphasize in those stories. Yet according to the Bible, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah chose to ignore this ancient tradition, this human necessity. As for Lot, who does provide hospitality, who does welcome his guests, he too is in mortal danger, simply because he made a bad choice in a place to live. His attraction to much of what Sodom offers apparently makes it hard for him to leave, even in the face of imminent destruction. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Genesis 19:15. You can judge Lot's character in general from the fact that he delays leaving Sodom even after he hears that the place is going to be destroyed. He hesitates, and he hesitates because he has such an attachment to the city, to its riches, to his life there, that even though he knows that it's going to be destroyed, he finds it hard to break away. But the destruction is coming, and it is coming soon. The Bible's account of the last moments of Sodom and Gomorrah may have gotten some startling support from science. Here at Babadra, what fascinates scholars is that when the city's walls collapsed around 2,400 years before Christ, they collapsed suddenly. Modern carbon dating indicates that the nearby town of Numeira also perished at this time, and in the same way. Two ruins of two cities, dating back to the time of the biblical Abraham, the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. Two cities which science tells us came to a sudden catastrophic end, very much like the biblical Sodom and Gomorrah. But these cities have not yet yielded all their secrets, and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and of Lot, his wife, and two daughters, is not yet ended. Mysteries of the Bible will return here on A&E. We now return to Mysteries of the Bible. It might have been the kind of quiet one could feel on the fateful morning in the wilderness some 5,000 years ago. The silence before the storm. As God is about to unleash his wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah, the two visiting angels hurry Lot and his family from their home. The fateful time for the evil cities has come. The sun had risen over the land as Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained down fire and brimstone from the sky upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, and he overthrew those cities and destroyed all the plain and everyone living there and everything growing in the ground. Genesis 19:23. As Lot and his family flee the terrible destruction behind them, a stern warning from God may well have been echoing in their minds. When Lot still hesitated, the angel seized his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and rushed them to safety outside the city, for the Lord was merciful. Flee for your lives, the angels told him, and don't look back. Escape to the mountains. Don't stay down here on the plain or you will die. Genesis 20, 16. It is now that Lot's wife makes a fatal mistake. 
A mistake that will instantly freeze her into the minds of all who will ever hear the story. And he overthrew those cities and destroyed all the plain and everyone living there and everything growing in the ground. But Lot's wife looked back from behind him and she turned into a pillar of salt. Genesis 19.23 And so Lot's wife is suddenly frozen into a pillar of salt for disobeying God's edict not to look back at the dying cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But why did God warn the family not to look back? What did the command have to do with God's anger? And what could possibly have compelled Lot's wife to disobey it? She felt this impulse to turn around and to see what it was that she was leaving behind and to take a last lingering look. And in some ways it's parallel to the idea of the Israelites who had to die in the desert before they could move into the land of Israel because unless you can abandon your ties to the enslaved and corrupted past, you can't move into the future. She's frozen into a pillar of salt. Now, the idea of a pillar of salt probably comes from the natural formations at the Dead Sea of, of salt pillars that are created from the evaporation of the water. However, the moral of the story again, I think, is that small commands aren't to be ignored just because they're small. Ever since the story of Sodom and Gomorrah was first handed down through time, proof of what happened to Lot's wife can be seen or imagined in the human shape of the many salt formations that dot the edge of the Dead Sea. For these believers, one or another of these abstract shapes represents the literal transformation of Lot's wife. Some biblical archaeologists believe the legendary Sodom and Gomorrah are buried here, under the southern end of the Dead Sea. It is only 20 feet deep, but this body of water lies 1,500 feet below sea level, the lowest point on Earth. The Dead Sea has a salt content of 35%, the highest in the world. No plants, no animal, nothing can live in its waters. But there is salt everywhere, in the air, in the ghostly formations that abound by the sea. And of course, salt plays a major role in the unforgettable aftermath of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the story of Lot's wife. This biblical story would have happened approximately four and a half thousand years ago, some 2,400 years before Christ. When Barbadra, the ruin scholars believe may once have been the city of Sodom, was at its peak of prosperity, with a population of thousands. Elsewhere on the planet during this period, cultures were rapidly advancing. In China, silkworms were first being cultivated to make garments. In Egypt, the Great Pyramid at Giza had already been completed. And in Peru, gold was being fashioned into decorative objects. Back at Sodom and Gomorrah, which lay fully 1,000 feet below the level of the sea, Lot and his two daughters face a desolate landscape indeed. Having left Lot's wife immobilized behind them, they are the only survivors of God's apocalypse. It may have felt like they were the only ones left on earth. And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us. After the manner of all the earth, come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Genesis 19.30 The sense is in the Bible that the reason they do it is because all the people that they have ever known have just been destroyed. And it's as if there are no more men in the world. They don't know that there is a world out there full of other people. And in some ways, their action is almost praiseworthy. They're not willing to give up on the world. They want more human beings. And so the only way they know, they create human beings to repopulate the world. 
The story of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot would find its way into both the Christian and Muslim religions. Seven centuries after Christ, a group of monks built a shrine to St. Lot. In 1991, a cave is uncovered behind a wall of the shrine. Could this have been the place where Lot sired the children of his daughters? The possibility that they've uncovered Lot's cave seems to me highly doubtful. How could one possibly know which cave 3,000 years ago Lot and his daughters had intercourse in? I think it's entirely speculative. But for many biblical scholars, locating Sodom and Gomorrah is possible because so many references are made to ancient evil cities in the Bible. Attention is focused on Baba Dra and the smaller site of Numera, seven miles to the south, as the potential candidates for the two doomed cities. Scientists have come to believe that both places came to sudden ends about 2350 BCE. Burn marks are still visible throughout the sites. Walls and towers apparently collapsed violently and not through erosion. But earthquakes are not uncommon in the area, nor are invasions by enemies. What severe forces cause the sudden end of these two cities is only one of many puzzles. The central question confronting biblical experts is whether or not they have in fact found Sodom and Gomorrah. No writings have yet been found at these two sites to help experts with their search. Yet enough physical evidence from Babadra has been scientifically authenticated to be exhibited in the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Even the way people looked and lived 5,000 years ago is gradually being reconstructed by dedicated experts above the Smithsonian's exhibition halls. Scientists continue to investigate the story of the ancient biblical cities. What more can be known about the people who may have lived in Sodom and Gomorrah? And how were the cities actually destroyed? And what truly caused the sudden end of Babadra and Numera, the two places that may have been the Bible's evil cities? The answers when we return. Mysteries of the Bible will return here on A and E. We now return to Mysteries of the Bible. And Abraham rose up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and beheld. And lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Genesis 19.27 The deep, blood-red color of this part of the Dead Sea would seem to support the supernatural events related in the Bible. It's not hard to conceive of fire and brimstone rising from the bowels of the earth to rain down and engulf the places God had singled out for punishment. Objectively, of course, we know that the high mineral content of the sea is cause for the many amazing characteristics of this unique body of water. In this otherwise hostile, forbidding area of the world, the southern end of the Dead Sea, the mining of bromide and potash provides the main commercial endeavor. Here in the vicinity of the Dead Sea works, sightseers are scarce. Yet it is known that in biblical times, especially on the Jordanian side of the sea, there was enough fertile land to provide for both agricultural and city living. There are also many archaeological ruins, some uncovered recently, some waiting to be discovered. In 1965, an excavation here at Baba Dra reveals far more than anyone expected. Well-preserved pottery and the carbon dating of artifacts and human remains found in its vast cemetery make clear that the life of Baba Dra spanned a thousand-year period. But it was something else that intrigued archaeologists, evidence that this once thriving ancient city suffered a fatal calamity around 2350 BCE. 
that abruptly ended its history. Nevertheless, scholars were slow to embrace the idea that this site may have been the legendary Sodom of the Book of Genesis, primarily because there was no other city nearby. In other words, if Baba Dra was Sodom, where was Gomorrah? Then in 1973, two American archaeologists are driving along a nearby area of the Dead Sea. One spots what looks like an ancient wall high above the plains. They stop the car and make their way toward the ruins in the blazing June heat. Both men are quite familiar with Baba Dra, seven miles north, but this is an uncharted place. The discovery they are about to make will add a dramatic new connection between history and the Bible. The discovery of Numera by Tom Schaub and myself uh, really was one of the most exciting things that has happened to me, and I'm sure also to Tom Schaub, in our lives. The actual discovery of Numera, uh, I look back on it as one of the most exciting days of, of my archaeological involvement. And so with great expectation and, and astonishment, really, uh, saying to each other, do you see what I see here? I can only explain that um, in the excitement of trying to put Baba Dra in a better context and to find another site so close by, built along the same pattern, also along the Dead Sea, obviously related, uh, was really quite astonishing to us. It is a tremendous find for the two young doctors, Schaub and Rast. For the first time, it seems possible that here at last is the second of the two ancient evil cities. In that stillness of that very hot summer day, we also could hear the burbling of the, of the water running down uh, the Wadi and Numera, and which fortified our sense. Here we have clearly the, the, the necessary elements for occupation, the wall, water, uh, ceramic evidence that allowed us to date the town. The assumption of many people had been that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah lay between the waters of the south end of the Dead Sea. And therefore they thought you would never find any remains of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, but Babadra might have been the place where they brought their dead to bury them. It is a clear sign that these ancient sites had been suddenly destroyed that made it possible that these might indeed be the biblical cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The discovery of this second site at Numeira, which uh, was again a walled site, and the fact that we could see very clearly that this site had, had been uh, violently destroyed, because every place and every trench that we were looking, there was deep burn debris, and uh, subsequently in our excavations we have found burn uh, through most of the site. Uh, this, this raised for us the question whether maybe we might have had uh, some evidence here of, um, of those cities. The most dramatic evidence of the end of Numera comes from the tower and our excavation of the tower at the eastern end of the site. There, as we were clearing away the stones, we uncovered the skeletal remains of three individuals. Uh, the tower had clearly fallen and crushed them, uh, and what is striking is that uh, they the inhabitants of the town, whether they cleared out in a hurry or whether they were part of some sort of massive catastrophe, did not come back or were not able to, to uh, locate uh, the bodies of these three individuals. Doctors Rast and Schaub would lead the first major excavations of both Babedra and Numera, a daunting task that began in 1975 and continued to 1981. The 30 acres of Babadra would soon turn out to be one of the richest sources of Bronze Age knowledge in the Middle East. It was now possible to reconstruct how people looked, lived, and died 5,000 years ago. Burial sites proved to be exceptionally valuable to researchers. Dr. Daniel Ortner, a biological anthropologist at the Smithsonian Institution, was an early recruit to the excavation. These 
tomb chambers at the base of the shaft were sealed off with mud mortar and stones. And I would take a tool and remove these stones and get the first look in. And to realize that you were the first person who had seen the materials inside that uh, for the last 5,000 years was a very moving and exciting experience, I can tell you. And uh, the uh, contents were always very carefully laid out, uh, typically with skulls arranged to the left of the tomb chamber. Clearly, people had taken a lot of time and invested a lot of care and thought in the rituals, the religious rituals that had been associated with this. I was also very touched by the fact that children, unlike many archaeological sites, children were actually buried in the tombs as well as the adults, so that they cared about people at all age levels, regardless of how old they were. From my standpoint, the people at Sodom and Gomorrah were very much nicer than what the Old Testament story might have suggested. If it is possible these sites might be the original Sodom and Gomorrah, then how could the people have been as decent and as caring for their children as the archaeological evidence seems to suggest. Then again, the archaeology also suggests that the cities came to a sudden, terrible end. What on earth could have caused this calamitous destruction? We journey further into history and into the Old Testament cities of Sodom and Gomorrah when we return. Mysteries of the Bible will be right back. We now return to Mysteries of the Bible, here on A&E. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of the heaven. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Genesis 19, 23. This remarkable story, passed on from generation to generation, has captured the world's imagination for at least 5,000 years. Since those ancient times, scholars and scientists have been pursuing any possible connection between the Old and New Testaments and the well-documented events of world history. The results are often inconclusive. The Bible is remarkably imprecise about where Sodom and Gomorrah are. Many scholars have put this, the, 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 the setting of the stories at the northern end of the Dead Sea in the Jordan Valley because Genesis describes the, the location of Sodom as like the Garden of God, sort of like the Garden of Eden, a lush, oasis-like area. And although there was probably more abundant water in the vicinity of Babadra and Numera than there is today, uh, I don't think at the time that these cities flourished in the third millennium BC that anyone would have called them the Garden of God. My interpretation of Babadra and Nimera regarding Sodom and Gomorrah is simply to say that of all that we know at the present time, and I believe that we will know in the future, is that these two sites would be the best possible explanation in relation to those accounts if we are going to find anything in the way of evidence uh, behind these stories. After all the historical and archaeological investigations are said and done, the central question remains, did Sodom and Gomorrah actually exist? Or is the Bible giving us this story as a morality tale? My sense is that Sodom and Gomorrah is both historical and mythological. That is, the evil that's described there is real. Um, the destruction of cities in ancient times no doubt happened and sometimes in ways that were very mysterious. But as always with the Bible, I think the historicity, that is, whether it actually occurred as given in the Bible, takes a back seat to the spiritual import of it. I don't believe that the Bible would be worth it if all it were were an exact chronicle of historical events with no deeper significance. The reason we read the Bible is because it's different than the list of kings that we have from Egypt or the chronicles that we have from ancient Sumer. It's a story that tells of the struggle between God and human beings to reach towards each other and of the many faltering steps along the way. 
And in that sense, I understand it to be true, truer even than a mere factual history. The parched, desolate, and windswept land at the southern end of the Dead Sea remains a silent witness. One of the most tantalizing mysteries in all of history. A mystery as fundamental as the struggle between good and evil. Perhaps the very nature of good and evil itself. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah chose to be evil. They chose whatever darkness was in their souls over the light. And I'm not sure that any outside explanation, however minute and detailed and careful historical, archaeological, sociological, will ever really penetrate what has been for most of human history the ultimate mystery, which is why is there so much darkness in God's world? Perhaps it is, after all, nothing more and nothing less than a matter of faith. And the Lord said, because of the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. Genesis 18, 20. Who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? Where was Jesus really born? How did the walls of Jericho fall? These are some of the mysteries explored in Mysteries of the Bible. Call 1-800-423-1212. And for just three payments of $39.95 plus shipping and handling, you can own this collector set of Mysteries of the Bible. All 13 episodes on six video cassettes narrated by Richard Kiley. Call now, 1-800-423-1212. Too many cooks can spoil the broth. But you only need one to make a mystery. True. Poirot takes the case of the Clapham cook Sunday. And now it's an all-new A&E's and Evening at the Improv. Next.